to welcome Janice McCoy to FIU today and to introduce her to all of you. Um, I've known Janice since we first entered graduate school at the University of Virginia. Um, and she's both a great colleague and a really good friend. Uh, well, working on her dissertation, Janice began, uh, while well, writing her dissertation, Janice began working for the Morgan Library and Museum. And the Morgan Library, for those of you who aren't already familiar with it, is one of North America's four premier research libraries. And it's particularly well known for its small but highly valuable collection of medieval manuscripts. Um, there, Janice regularly develops talks, tours, and workshops rel related to the Morgan exhibits. I think it's also worth noting that Janice's, um, most of Janice's colleagues are trained in art history. Janice herself um, majored as an undergraduate in English literature. And so she highlights, I think, in a really interesting way, how English majors can create fascinating career opportunities for themselves, sometimes in unexpected contexts. She's going to be sharing today um, her expertise in the study of the origins of medieval paints and the materials from which they're derived. So, um, I hope you all feel welcome throughout this talk to ask questions of your own. Um, and please join me with welcoming Janice tonight. In addition to you asking me questions, I'm going to be asking you questions. This is an interactive uh, talk and not just a lecture. So, um, if those voice boxes are coming back, I'm going to be asking you things. Um, so, we're talking about medieval paints and their origins. And, um, Specifically, the context is going to be medieval manuscripts. So I thought before we started, I want to make sure everyone's comfortable with the term medieval. Yes. How many of you are currently studying the Middle Ages in class? I know there are a bunch of you here, but so some of you are not. Um, would perhaps someone in the class on the Middle Ages tell those who aren't currently studying the Middle Ages what time period we're talking about? I bet you didn't know your be quiz tonight. <laughs> so anybody give me, give me some dates. There you go, 12th to 14th centuries. Yeah, that's core middle age. Um, it can stretch a little bit before and a little bit after, but that is very good what we're going to be talking about. Um, some of the materials we'll be seeing and talking about are 15th century, but um, that's before. Okay, how about manuscript? Do you know what a manuscript is? I think we all have a sense of maybe what it is, but defining it is sometimes tricky. Um, but we're in Miami, and so there must be some Spanish speakers in the house. Yeah? Anyone give me the Spanish word for hand? Too mono. Mono. Okay, it comes from the Latin manus, which is the same man in the manuscript. So, hand. Everybody knows what script is, right? So, any book that's handwritten is a manuscript, um, which means you can right now create your own manuscripts, right? But we're talking about medieval manuscripts. So, these were the books of the Middle Ages. Um, in fact, all the books of the Middle Ages up until 1455 were manuscripts. Does anyone know why? The printing press wasn't invented until 1455, right, by Gutenberg. Okay, so if you wanted a book, you had to copy someone else's book. That was how books were made, every, every book made by hand. Um, so what I have up here, actually, are some loose leaf pages from actual manuscripts um, that I thought we would pass. I'm going to save that one. Yeah, save this one. Okay. Um, I'll start one here. And you guys take a look. Step one over here. of these belong to the press of love. This one is mine. Um, so you'll get a chance to look at them. And those of you who are here on that, can you tell what they're written on? What is that material that you're holding in your hands? We'll get to colors eventually, I promise. Sorry? Yeah, it's animal skin. Okay, so you're holding animal skin. Um, we have one other little manuscript page which is on paper. And if you hold it up to the light, you will see they're, little, they're called chain lines, um, which they were used to create paper. Um, does anyone know what part of the world is responsible for the production of paper, the invention of paper? Yes. Egypt. Egypt created, did create a very early sort of paper thing called papyrus, right? You guys know that? It was their paper substitute. Um, and it was used in China. not just yeah, China did paper, right? Okay, so the Egyptians used papyrus. Europe was using papyrus as well. 
Um, but it was harder for them because papyrus wasn't native to Europe, so they had to import papyrus. Um, and there's actually a great story about the invention of parchment, which is the animal skin. Um, I think it's a apocryphal, but the story is that there was a Turkish ruler and the ruler of Alexandria in Egypt, and they were having a competition to see who could build the best and the biggest library. Well, if you're having a competition, you're not going to share your resources with your competitor. So the Egyptians were sort of being cagey with their papyrus, and so the Turks had to look around and find some something native, something that was local, cheap, plentiful, easy, um, and they just got, they thought, figured out animal skin. Um, it's probably not a true story, but the rationale behind why parchment instead of papyrus, um, that's all true, right? You wanted something local, you wanted something relatively cheap, you're already eating those animals, you're already raising those animals, why not use the skins instead of trying to ship parchment over the ocean? I mean, papyrus, sorry, over the ocean. Um, China had paper, China figured out paper, um, but it wasn't in, until late 14th century, early 15th century that it started coming into Europe and replacing parchment. Um, it's cheaper and easier to produce than animal skins, so you don't have to raise a whole herd of animals to create one book, right? You can just, they were using recycled linen, basically, to make their paper. Um, so why did it take so long to get from China? Well, the Chinese were holding on to that secret. It was uh, like a early um, trade secret. So the secret of silk and the secret of paper, <coughs> Chinese kept it themselves. Um, and again, another great story, not sure how true it is. There was a war on the border of China. A town was captured, some paper makers were in um, that town, and so the secret of paper got out. So that's why we use paper now. Um, so if you're not sure things you're trying to get past, if you're not sure if what you're looking at is parchment or paper, or if it's little, a piece of paper is little, but if you hold it up, you can see the lines that are um, the relic of early paper making process. Um, and I believe all the pages they're passing are 15th century. Um, so there we are. Okay, so that's medieval manuscript. That's our, um, whoops. Oh, no input detected anymore. Okay. Yeah, it's not the power. <laughs> it's just going for the power for it. Okay, okay. Um, that's all right. I can draw on that for you. Draw on that. <laughs> that's okay. I'm not skilled. My students can pass to this. <laughs> what we are going to do, actually, is just take a look, and I'll just borrow one of these, um, at a, an image of a manuscript. So I'll just hold this up, go to low text for a second. Very appropriate for a medieval presentation, right? Um, so parchment, this isn't real parchment, this is a facsimile, but handwritten would have taken teams of people a long time to create one book. Um, but also beautiful artwork, beautiful paintings um, in the books. And so what we're going to talk about today is how those were created. So if you all were going to sit down to make painting, you'd probably go to an art store, right? Buy some paint, buy paintbrushes, sit down. Um, couldn't do that in the Middle Ages. You had to start kind of from scratch. Um, so where would you go to get color in the world? Plants, definitely, yep. Stones. Even today, there's no automation. People are 
producing saffron the same way today as they were in the Middle Ages, picking it by hand. Um, it's grown in India. Um, the largest source today for saffron, does anyone know? This surprised me, actually. Spain. Spain is where it's probably our largest supplier, and that's where this one comes from. Yeah, Spain is where we get most of our saffron. But the, sort of the world supply of saffron, like 90% of it, Iran. Um, medieval Persia was the big saffron. Um, so, what I have, you guys familiar with this? Yes. Mortar and pestle? We'll go ahead this, yes. Um, we're going to grind up these saffron threads. Anybody have any idea what color we're going to get when we grind up the saffron? Orange. Orange and yellow? Okay, you guys got some cooks in the audience. Um, when I show this to little kids, what color do you think they guess? Red. Red, red. yeah, because it's red. But um, we'll work on laughing. Okay, so we need a volunteer. All right, in the back, fantastic. Will you come up? Oh, were you going to volunteer too? I, I'll, I'll let you find something later, I promise. Yeah, it's not, it's 
connection, the network connection is lost. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, so Malachi comes from the Ural Mountains. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is, as his materials come back up, I'm going to put them back up at the table. If at the end you miss something and you want to see something, feel free to come up and do a little exploration. You got something that's already cut around? <laughs> Everybody had a chance to handle the arsenic? No. But no. Cool. Yeah. <laughs>
We're making progress in the background there. Excellent. Okay. Um, let me check my notes and make sure I'm on track since I don't have mine. Okay. Um, okay, so we have saffron and we have green powder. We're not yet to paint. So what's missing to take our powder to paint? A binding agent and fluid. Yes, in our case, we would be using water. Yeah, so something sticky to bind. What kinds of things do you think should be used for binding? Oil, right, especially if you're making an oil-based paint. Rather than a water-based paint, you could use oils. Eggs, yeah, for like a tempera style. Yeah? Gel. I thought gelatin would be sticky. I don't know that. Okay. It is used as a binding too. Okay, so yes, gelatin. Gum arabic is also a really good binding agent. Tree sap, basically. So something sticky, something fluid, and then our color. Okay. Alright, we're just okay. reversing to the start, I think. Nope, you're going forward. Oh, that's it's a reverse button. <laughs> ah. There we go. Okay, and then if you click in the lower right hand corner, you can get it full screen. There we go. Okay, so if you can advance me. There's the image I was going to be using, but I think our um, <coughs> image also works well. This is, some of you have seen this before, this is the tray reviewer. Um, And you can see this is a very deluxe manuscript, and you can tell because of the use of blue. 
Blue is always one of the most expensive colors. Um, so it's proclaiming its own high status by saying, my patron can afford to buy this much blue. Um, it's also quite a beautiful color. So. Um, if you look at medieval manuscripts, there's one image that's often blue, if anything is blue, the Virgin Mary. Um, let's see if she, she in that image back there. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, but if you, you're familiar with pictures, um, Christian images, Virgin Mary's often in blue. She's there. And that's, yeah, she's, she's there? Yeah, she's there. Is she in blue, though? Yes, yeah, so and she's in blue. She is in blue. Okay. okay. <laughs> it becomes part of the iconography because she was given the prominent, the most expensive, the best color. If you could afford to do blue in your manuscript and you had images you had to choose, you gave her the blue. So that's why she's blue. Okay, so now we're going to move forward to talk about some other colors, I believe. There we are, blue. There we go, other colors. This is a different manuscript, um, a little hard to see. This um, it's an Ellesmere manuscript. What you might not be able to tell because it's a little washed out is there are much more earth tones. Um, the Treasure uses the most expensive, highest quality colors. A lot of other manuscripts find ways to do colors a little differently. So, um, if you advance, we will... Okay, so, those are good. Um, <laughs> so, there were other ways of getting blue. Indigo blue. Um, this is another high status blue. Um, it's from a plant. You guys heard of indigo? Mm -hmm. um, we have artificial indigo now, and that's if anyone's wearing blue jeans, like that's blue jeans in the house. Um, those are usually dyed now with artificial indigo. Back in the Middle Ages, indigo was not artificial, um, and it was coming from mostly India, um, and for years this was a really expensive, high status color. Um, so there was a substitution that was made in the Middle Ages for something cheaper, right? You want to try to find, especially if you're not one of those people who can afford the expensive one, you want to see if you can get something cheaper. So woad, which is a plant, um, was grown in Europe. There's a problem with woad though. Once you have sowed your field with woad, harvested your crop, the field is now useless for a long time. Um, it, it starves the soil of nutrients. Um, so this was an incredibly popular and cheap dye, and so everybody wanted blue clothes, and so the fashion <coughs> industry of the Middle Ages was sort of threatening starvation to the population sometimes. So it was a balance. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a problem. Okay, and next we have pink, which you can't tell in here. Maybe you can see better in here. The, um, the border here is half pink. Um, and that was usually matter, which was a root. And that was grown locally in Europe, so that was um, affordable. Okay. Um, for white, eggshells or chalk. Um, again, cheap, local, easy to produce. Um, and remember, we're on parchment. So modern artists, when you're using white, you can just leave it blank for white. On parchment, you have to actually paint it white, otherwise it's sort of Brown. <coughs> so they actually, this was the earliest part um, pigments ever used, dating back to those cave paintings. Um, they were using clays and earths, and you could get a, you can actually get a whole variety of colors, from red to yellow to orange to brown. Um, but they're what we call earth tones, so they weren't as exciting as some of these other colors we're talking about. Um, and so now red. So one, one of the colors we haven't talked about um, is red. There's not much red in here. There was a lot of red in the Trader Joe. Um, black. Have you ever heard of black? L-A-C? It's probably, I wouldn't be surprised if that's related etymologically. I don't know that for sure. Um, basically, this is, uh, there's a bug, I believe it lives in India. It, when it lays its eggs, a fluid comes out. And that fluid, when it dries and is powdered, um, can be turned to this red, beautiful, brilliant red color. Um, but sort of like saffron, you have to, it has to be scraped up by hand in small quantities. So very, very expensive. Uh, it also turns out this is slightly toxic, so again, don't know if it's <laughs> not like arsenic, but it's not something that we can use in the classroom um, for that reason. So, oh, and I also have some indigo. I'm gonna pass around this indigo. High status blue. Um, okay, so there's that's a possibility. 
not a great possibility. So we go and we get something called Kermes. Have you heard of that? Also called cochineal, although that actual term I'll discuss in a minute. Um, these are bugs. Somebody mentioned bugs. These are the bugs themselves. So the lac is the bug egg fluid. Comes out with the eggs. <laughs> the um, educators at the morning call it bug poop, but it's, it's not accurate. It's, it's more like bug afterbirth. Um, <laughs> shell, there's a chemical, and so you can actually crush up the beetle itself. Um, and when you do that, you get um, a beautiful red, red-purple, um, and you need to kind of mix it with something to really make that red pop. And so one of the things they mixed it with um, was something called alum, um, which you can actually buy in the grocery store. I think we got this at Walmart. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Your local Walmart has alum. It's used, it, uh, according to this jar, it's used for pickling, so that's why it's available. In the Middle Ages, they used it to react with the Kermese beetle, um, and then also as a way of dyeing fabric. If you treated the fabric with this first, it would take the color better. Um, and alum is a fun story because it was mined sort of on the edge of the Mediterranean, and the Turkish Empire was expanding and taking over more and more of the mines. <coughs> not giving it to the Europeans or giving it to them at a very high price. Um, and so this is a problem for um, people dyeing clothes, for people trying to paint Hermes. Um, and so it was suddenly discovered that there was alum in Italy. This was a big deal. Um, and the Pope had authority over the, those mines, and he would lease them out. And one of the winners of the contest to see who could lease these mines were the Medici's. For the Medici's, yeah? It's one of the foundations of their wealth is alum. Um, so, alum mixed with Kermes. Um, so there's the manuscript a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to Mexico, um, which obviously in the Middle Ages, we all know this is impossible, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the 15th century, it is possible. So this is sort of the, the board, you know, if you're, if you're a medievalist, we sometimes like to colonize um, <laughs> the late 15th century. Um, so Spain comes over to Mexico and discovers that there is a beetle that has the same sort of chemical compound as the Kermes beetles that were in Poland and Armenia. Um, but they're much more plentiful and they're much more potent. So fewer bugs makes much more brilliant, stronger color. Um, and so they started importing it to Europe and using it. But just like the Chinese, they didn't tell people where it was coming from. They didn't tell people what the source was. Um, all of a sudden, you were just getting these amazing colors. Um, and so it wasn't until the cochineal, they were actually making like cochineal plantations in Mexico. They started spreading throughout Latin America. And so then the English and the French got a hold of their own cochineal. But for a while, the Spanish um, had a monopoly on this new cochineal. They, would they were shipping back silver and cochineal. Those are the two great sources of wealth coming over from Spain um, in the early modern period. Okay, so we have cochineal beetles with a little bit of alum and tiny little mortars and pestles, and I have a whole bunch. So we're all going to get a ch chance to grind these, okay? Um, so let's see. I have a question. Yes. Um, this is probably stupid, so I apologize no. in advance. But were they, when you said they were shipping cochineal, did they kill them first? Or like, how do you ship? How do you ship cochineal? <laughs> yes, I do believe they were dead. They were dead beetles. Yes, like um, there's a story of some pirates who captured, a, or tried to capture a Spanish ship. The Spanish ship got away, but they got the longboat. And the longboat had these casks of what looked like black sand. You'll see, they, look, they don't look like beetles. They look like little black stones. And they thought it was worthless at first. Um, and somehow or other, they, they, they crushed one. And you'll see what happens when you crush it. Um, they, they got, they understood what it was they had, and they had the fortune and die. So yeah, they were, they were traveling dead. Um, and you were also being given dead bugs. I'm not giving you a lot of beetles, so. so just don't be shy. Um, what I ask you to do is just grind it a couple of times and then pass it to, um, to the next person. And I'm gonna pass one on ground without a pestle so that everyone gets a chance to see what it looks like before it's been ground, because I imagine people in the middle are going to get um, pushed up. <laughs> yes? Do you know what these beetles do? They, if you we, were in the they, house, they, they live beetles. on the cactus, the prickly pear cactus. I never so I, I believe they're eating the cactus, that's where they live. So, I mean, 
It's in their shell, and there are similar cousin beetles in Europe who are not living on cactus. So I don't know if the cactus is necessary to the color or just necessary to the um, I'm, I'm not enough of a chemist to know where that chemical is actually coming from. Okay, so this is the unground one. Isn't that why they didn't have red M in this Um, Yeah, a safe, a safe non-toxic red is quite tricky. Um, so we've already talked about <laughs> we've already talked about um, lac and um, the, well the Kermit beetles okay, but lac is, is a little bit poisonous. Um, they also used vermilion, which was mercury and sulfur, and you had to cook that. So obviously that's not something you're going to eat. It makes a beautiful red, but can't do it in the classroom and, and you can't eat it. Um, so, so yeah, we've said there are modern reds now that you can use, but but all of them they're often. This red snake didn't they take it off the market because it was the Beatles that people had found them out. No, the red I believe the red M Ms were taken off because they discovered that that particular food dye was carcinogenic. Um, Starbucks had to take the beetle out of their strawberry lattes because people were vegan and didn't realize they were eating ground bug. It's used as a food dye. Um, it's in like wine punch, yellow, uh, pink yogurt, um, lipstick, all kinds of makeup. It's very, very safe. If you think about it, it's a bug. That's, that's something that animals and people eat all the time, are bugs. Um, as opposed to something cooked in a laboratory where you don't really know what it is and how it's made. Um, I don't like to think about eating the bugs, but I think sort of logically, I think it's a bit safer. Um, I did, after I learned, hold on a second, I'll, I will tell him. After I, I, after I learned about the kosher meal meal, I ran home and checked my pink yogurt, and it was dyed with beets, so don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, is there anything that they're doing now maybe to preserve the color or make it pop more or something that doesn't make it dangerous? I mean, just <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, yes, I don't know enough about food production to know what they're doing, but yeah. Um, but yeah, we're still, we're still using, so how are the, how are the bugs looking? Yeah, you see those? Yeah. Yeah, is there a question in the back? 
tradesmen who knew this, right, and, you, and, and all that grinding that you guys were doing, that would have been the work of an apprentice, right? So you've learned that as an apprentice trade. Um, but there were records, manuscript records, of how to make colors. Um, the people who figured out, for example, if you baked mercury and sulfur together, you could get red, were the alchemists. You all heard about the alchemists? Um, I think one of the greatest his things in history in terms of paint color is the fact that they were trying to make gold and they could never do it. So it was this impossible quest that they were on, but they just kept experimenting and experimenting and experimenting, and they came in with all these amazing things. Not gold, of course, um, but they gave us a lot. So, yeah. um, how did they get the pattern on the back of the, on the background, the gold, how it has like a... Okay, so you would glue the gold leaf down and stamp it. Yeah, they used to glue the stamp. Yeah. Um, so in your research, did you get most of it from manuscripts? Did you do a lot of trial and error? Did you find a lot of Oh, what? <laughs> um, so if anyone is interested, this is a fantastic book about the story of color. So I've read this cover to cover multiple times. Um, at the morning, we get training in this because we do what, what you all have been doing, we do with school groups. They come in and they, and they we look at manuscripts and then they get to grind stuff up. Um, and as part of my training, I got to do all that grinding too. Um, I did not discover cochineal or saffron or any of that stuff. I was taught that, um, just as I am passing that on to you. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm wondering kind of like, where has your research taken you? Like, has it, like, have you traveled to see um, things? Has it been? Not intentionally. Um, this is just my museum job, so this is not, this is not totally overstep with my own personal research. Um, but for example, I can't not run into things. I was in Peru um, and discovered that dating back from the Incan times, they're still using cochineal to dye clothes. Um, and we used alum, right, when you guys were all grinding, and that makes it sort of come out purpley. Um, if you put lemon juice in, it's yellow. It comes out sort of a yellowy color. And depending on what additive you put, you can get a whole rainbow of colors. And I didn't know that until I saw the, this Incan woman with her loom, and she had all these different colors from cochineal. So, you know, if you keep your eye out and you pay attention, um, this stuff is all around still. So, yeah, so I haven't, I, I wouldn't call myself um, a researcher in the history of color. Um, I, I study medieval literature, um, and then for the museum, I have tried to become as expert as possible on color so that I can share that knowledge. Um, and one of the things I love about it is, yeah, it's chemistry and it's materials, but it tells you about medieval history. It tells you that if you were living in medieval France and making a medieval manuscript, you were buying at the market objects that had been traded all along this trade route. Are you guys familiar with this trade route that went all the way to China? There's a special term for it? Silk Road. Silk Road, right? So the Silk Road, by, by working with this kind of material, you see an object like this facsimile is sort of representation of Silk Road all come together on one page, which I think is amazing. And then you get great stories like Alan and the, the history of the Medicis, or Spain and the Cochineal um, monopoly and um, China holding on to their paper secret and all of this stuff I just think is great. Um, and you just get it from the color. It's sort of a fun entry into history. So, any other questions? Yeah. Well, your conversation you just had made me wonder, are there any colors in these manuscripts that they never have figured out what the source is? I would not be surprised. Um, the problem is trying to figure out what they're made of. Um, I don't know how much intervent, like how much you can, information you can get just by looking, or whether you have to scrape something off, and, and you know you're not going to be scraping up the tray du jour. So um, the best they can do is like the expert we had from in, tries to replicate. Um, there are medieval manuscripts that describe materials and processes. And so they will try to replicate that, and they will paint something and hold it up and say, yeah. But of course, it's been aged 500 years or more, so you don't know for sure what that aging process does. Um, but you get a good sense, I think, of, of where these things may have come from. Yeah. So there wasn't like any um, master apprentice journals that gave you like the step-by-step -step process for a lot of these colors? Is there are. There are definitely some, some documents um, this book even gives you some transcriptions of those of those instructions. Some of them get a little bit warped um, as you copy manuscript for manuscript. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily make sense to someone who wasn't trained. So um, whether that was intentional, some, some of these things are kept secret on purpose. Um, you know, if you have a way of making the best red um, in your manuscript scriptorium, um, you don't necessarily want everyone to know that. So there were secrets, definitely. Um, but this was generally, you know, there are manuscripts out there with pictures of lapis and um, people didn't know how to do this. You could tell because of the profusion of manuscripts all over Europe um, using some of the same colors. So they must have, everybody must have known. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Was there a lot of like combining of colors or does that not work out well with they, the pigments? They didn't mix. Okay. They didn't mix the pigments. Um, Partly because if, you're mixed, if you've got a plant-based um, paint and a stone-based paint, they're just not going to blend. So what they would do, though, is you would you would do one color, let it dry, and then maybe do another color, kind of a glaze on top, so that the light would come through, and then that would create a combination of colors. Yeah. Um, they did. I think they did mix the like indigo and cochineal sometimes. There were some things that you could combine to, to sort of make the color more vivid or more of a shade that you wanted, but it wasn't, you didn't have a palette the way artists do today where they're just mixing everything that wasn't available to them. Um, so if you see a lot of medieval manuscripts, um, big blocks of color and not necessarily a lot of shading. There's some. So because sometimes it would be to put um, a layer on the letter drawing and another, they couldn't use a lot of layers, I'm, I'm assuming, just because. Because then it would just scrape off. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Yeah, you had to be careful. Not to create it. Um, although the gold was often raised and seems to have survived okay. So they were pretty careful with these books. Yeah. The manuscript that's being passed around, it doesn't look like it has layers on it at all. I mean, the gold. It well, this is a facsimile. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not a real, it, you, yeah, it's not a real, we couldn't afford that page. <laughs> <laughs> that entire manuscript um, is in the Morgan Library, um, kept together. So they disassembled it a few years ago. And, to rebind it and then put it all up on the walls. It's amazing. Because usually medieval manuscripts are books, um, so you can only see a couple pages at a time in a museum. Um, and, and usually when they're on display, they'll turn the pages periodically <coughs> so that the light doesn't damage it. Um, but occasionally you'll get a book that's been disassembled, and then, and then you can see the whole thing. And it's a real rare privilege. Um, but I recommend you guys go to come in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> There's more than one method. Um, when we do it at Morgan um, with our school groups, we use a particular kind of glue um, made out of fish. Um, it's made from a fish air bladder. So these are not bladders like we have. This hold air to help the fish go up and down. Um, and it's from sturgeon, um, from the Black Seas and the Caspian Sea. Um, why that? particular part of the fish is so sticky, I couldn't tell you how they figured that out, I couldn't tell you. Um, people, I think, are just, we are always like, what if we do this, and we find cool things and we do that. Yeah. Uh, how do they make black? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, there are a couple different ways to make black. This was one of the main components of black ink and paint. Um, it's an oak gall. Um, it grows on the side of an oak tree. Um, I think it's a bug infestation that causes it, and the, and the tree sort of reacts and throws out this gall. It's basically um, a tumor. <coughs> it's a tree tumor. We'll pass it around. <laughs> um, yeah, so that makes it a nice black, um, basically charcoal. Um, ashes you could do would make black. Yeah, black was pretty easy and cheap, um, which is lucky because that's what we want our ink to be. There's a really, uh, there's a fun, I think a funny story about gold in manuscripts. Um, the Morgan actually owns a few leaves of um, a <coughs> forger, somebody who got parchment, um, got the right materials like we've been using, um, and
copied the correct handwriting and got the right text and created basically you know, a leaf like this, except for much more beautiful with illustrations, and tried to sell it on the, you know, the book market um, to get some money, because this would be a lot cheaper than having to actually go out and buy your own manuscript page and resell it. Um, his fatal mistake was he antiqued the gold. He tried to make the gold look old so that the page would look old. But if you look at an actual, I mean, this one even has a little bit. If you look at an actual medieval manuscript, the gold is as shiny today as it was the day it was made. So he gave himself away. Um, so anybody, I don't think, I wouldn't be able to forge a medieval manuscript page. But just in case anyone out there wants to forge, do not age your gold. <laughs> Any other questions? That's a good question. OK. Um, we are right at 6.30. So um, we'll break. And if you guys. Oh, question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Question. Yeah, yeah. If you grind it up and mix it with some glue and put it on parchment. Eggshells, I mean, I can't understand how like leaves and berries can be eggshells. Eggshells. Well, eggshells are like stone. You grind them up until it's powder. And then you mix it with fluid and something sticky. Um, and you're painting a surface that's not white. It's a little bit off-white. So that, that eggshell part sticks out. Chalk also works, powdered chalk also. Also white lead. White lead, right? White lead um, and bone, believe it or not. It's been calcified enough, bone can be used. So, great. Thank you. More questions? Okay, so anyone who wants to come up and get a closer look at some materials, if you have materials in your hand, maybe you can bring them up, please. Um, oh, the, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, they're okay.